Hello everyone uh, and welcome to my talk for today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Selenium 4 which was only released a couple of weeks ago. Um, but before we get into that, uh, I would like to kind of just tell you who I am. My name is David. Uh, I head up the open source team at BrowserStack. I'm a Selenium core contributor. I'm a co-editor on the web driver specification within the W3C and I am the uh, chair of the Browser Testing T and Tools Working Group. So whenever th things want to be standardized, they tend to come through my working group where we try our best to make sure that all the browsers are going to support you, the end user. Um, and here is our agenda for today. So I'm going to be talking about what is Selenium for, some of the new features that have gone into it, like relative locators and new window APIs. Um, there's the new ability to print pages. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking through the new <clears throat> event-driven code, which allows you to kind of, instead of having to poll for how your test should work with Selenium, you can now get uh, events emitted to you and carry on with your tests. These are really cool new features. Um, and at the end, I'll just finish off on some of the really new, uh, great new features within Selenium Grid. Um, so Selenium 4 has been an amazing amount of work that has gone into it. Think of it kind of like building a city. It took five years for us to get this out and over 4,400 commits <clears throat> from numerous contributors around the world. Uh, we've rewritten large parts of the code base. Uh, we've deprecated large parts of the code base. And so whenever you start using it, it's going to be a, a big change. But the main change that you won't notice really is that you'll be able to just drop it in and things should just work. This is one of the key reasons that we've spent so much time getting uh, focusing on the little bits to make that easier. Uh, so when you change, there'll be a number of deprecation warnings that you'll have to work through, but none of them should be scary at all. It's all about kind of making sure that we're ready for whenever we go to Selenium 4.1 and beyond. So with that, I'm going to start talking about some of the really cool new features. One of the ones that I'm really excited about is relative locators. The idea here is that if you know where one element is on the page, you can start looking for other elements on the page quite simply. So in this case, if you want to do start in the center of the, the board here, where it says an open process, Selenium's an open, uh, open source project. So we'll, we want to do everything we can in the open. <laughs> and now we want to find anything to the top left, oh, sorry, to the top right, um, that might have open in it. So we, we would, the new ability would allow us to find an element starting with open process and then find anything to the top right that might have say a link text that says open or partial link text. And we start looking through the DOM to find what we can. We do this by using uh, technology that was first developed with Sahi and um, another project that ThoughtWorks manage. And it kind of just tries to do relative locating. It does this by looking at the bounding box. So the little squares uh, that each element on the page creates and sees how far away it is. It also does a little bit of like looking in within the DOM to see if it's close to you within the DOM itself, just try to try speed up some of the, the returns. And then when you get back a list of elements, um, they normally start uh, from closest to furthest away in case you have multiple. This is a really, really cool feature, but I would be very careful in using it in that if your page reflows or kind of, especially if you're going from desktop to mobile and you've got a smaller area to test on, um, things might not be in the same relative location. They might move down, they might move around. So just be aware, but it's a really cool feature when you do start using it. The next uh, 
set of APIs that I want to talk about is the new Windows APIs. For years, people have wanted Selenium to be, to kind of create new tabs. They wanted to be able to communicate from one tab to another or another, the window to another. Um, and Selenium's not really allowed that because we were never fully in control of the browser enough to be able to do this. Working with browser vendors, we found a way that we can do this. Um, and we learned a lot along the way. Window is one of those weird terms in a browser that kind of means so many different things. And this is one of the key problems that we had with the Selenium project when trying to support these. So for years, if you ever did something and it should have opened a new tab, you would have noticed that we tried to force it to open a new window. Now you'll be able to create new tabs, new windows, and then be able to move around between them using the, the existing uh, switch to window APIs. So this can be really, really cool. Um, we have the, the ability to create a specific window. So that would be a window with its own tab. Or if you want to just be in a tab, you could just go open a new tab. Um, this is available only in Selenium 4, um, but it, it'll work with anything, uh, any of the drivers that have it moving forward, which is definitely Chrome and Firefox. Um, and if Safari, I know, will be having it soon if it doesn't have it yet. The next feature that I we, we noticed a lot of people really wanting was the ability to print pages. Printing can be super hard um, to test against. And so people were trying weird and novel ways to print it. They would use Selenium with like a robot framework or kind of invoke new and wonderful ways to print it. Um, but now with the new page uh, printing APIs, you can pr create PDFs. These will be returned from a driver using uh, Base64 encoding so that you can uh, save those to disk or if, if you want, just kind of uh, re-encode it into a PDF document and then use it all in memory. Um, we noticed a lot of people wanted this feature just for basic automation, not necessarily for their testing, but for basic automation. Browser vendors wanted this feature because they actually wanted it to test uh, their new, like print features um, and to also test C CSS because they wanted to make sure that like if, if something looks the same, they're already doing their um, kind of image comparison testing, but this way it was another way to kind of make sure that CSS works the same between different browsers. So this is a really cool feature. Uh, I hope you use it. And if you had hit any bugs, do let us know. But the main set of features that I wanted to talk through um, today are around the event-driven code. People have liked some of these features uh, within Cypress or Playwright or Puppeteer. Unfortunately, kind of constantly upgrading uh, between play with Playwright and Puppeteer or um, kind of being bound by JavaScript sandboxes if you were using CSS and not being able to fully test your applications um, have meant kind of people weren't sure how to go ahead and test these things. So learning from what users want, because at the end of last year, we the Selenium project did its first ever survey and we listened to what people wanted and we've hopefully implemented some of the really cool features that they wanted. Um, we've added the ability to uh, get around basic authentication, digesting, um, so that whenever you have a, a website that's got basic authentication, we'll handle the, uh, the URL and allow allow you through. Um, in the past, if people wanted to find, like wait for a certain element to uh, have a mutation on the DOM, um, they would have to poll the driver and say, has this changed? Has this changed? And now uh, with the new APIs, you can set up a, a mutation listener. And so when it mutates, 
it can send a message back to your tests and you can carry on straight away, which is a really cool feature. And hopefully it will kind of make your tests a little bit less flaky. The third one, um, and this is one that a lot of people have been asking for, for as long as I've worked on the Selenium project, which is a, over a decade, um, is listening out for JavaScript errors. So if you're moving around a page and suddenly there's a JavaScript error, sometimes these are missed by Selenium tests and sometimes they're even missed by kind of your unit tests in JavaScript. The new APIs within Selenium 4 allow you to kind of listen for these JavaScript errors and then you could fail your tests instantly. Similarly with console logs, if you want to listen to and see what was happening uh, in a page. So if you said you wanted a test to wait for a certain console message, you could emit that and then carry on. Uh, and finally, one of the new features that we added is network interception. The ability to, whenever you're kind of making a, pay, a transition to a page, listen out for certain network calls, and then you could stub them out or mock them out and then use those responses in a meaningful way to allow you to kind of um, just change it how you want. So no longer do you have to only do happy path testing. You could do negative paths and kind of areas where like you don't send back valid JSON. How does your, your front end handle that? You'll be able to do a lot of those new features. Or if you just wanted to switch off your analytics, you'd be able to turn that off uh, with your network interception moving forward. Um, so I'm going to go through some example codes. They're only in the slides um, and because I don't have a lot of time to talk today. Um, so you, I can't show you them. But uh, hopefully, you'll get a sense of how simple kind of adding these features are to your code. So here's basic authentication. Um, so the main change for kind of Selenium users is that we have to create a CDP, CDP connection. A CDP connection is using the Chrome D debug protocol underneath the, um, to be able to speak to the drivers. Um, and in this case, so we've got, we create our connection. Whenever we want to do basic authentication, we would register. Uh, that we are likely to get something like this. So this tells us internally and um, to kind of speak to the, the browser that if you hit uh, authentication, um, these are the things that we want. So in this case, the first uh, argument is admin and that is your username. In this case, the password is also admin, not the best security, but anyway. Um, and we've got to use that connection, which is a WebSocket connection into the browser. We do what we want, and then, hey presto, we get through. So it's not really a lot of change. Um, and we need to do it in this way so that we can kind of make sure we set up the right connections along the way. For DOM mutations, uh, it's not that different. In this case, um, we're going to create our connection just as before. Um, and then whenever we get a, a log mutation event, um, it will be put into kind of in, into our listener. And then we carry on our tests. So in this case, I wanted to make sure that um, whenever I click, after I clicked a button, uh, that the display was no longer none, that it actually had a proper value. And then so in our test, we're just going to click or find the element, click it, um, find the revealed element in this case, and then make sure that um, we wait for it to be in the right state, and then we can do all our, all our assertions. So it's, again, we've tried to make this API as simple as possible. For JavaScript exceptions, um, we try to give you back as much of the information as possible. So 
in this case, we're going to create a onlog exception listener. And every time it fires, uh, we're going to be able to do whatever we want. In this case, I've created an assert um, to kind of make sure that I know in the, what the error is going to be, but it could be for anything. So if it ever got in there, you could just make a failure and then print out all the events. Uh, you'll be given uh, a JSON object. Um, oh, oh, sorry, it comes back as a JSON object, but then we, we would change it into kind of a normal object that you can work with. Uh, and you can kind of be able to get the exception details. You can see the whole stack trace if you wanted, or if you just wanted specific frames, you could have a look at that and then check what it is. Um, and so just adding your listener is the only thing you need to do. Otherwise your test would just be as normal. And that's what we see at the, the last like three lines of code. The next one is what I think a lot of people have been really excited about, which is network interceptions. Um, again, we create our connection and every time we have an intercept message come back. And so this one you need to be aware of. If you have a, a page that's doing a lot of uh, network calls, um, the driver and the code is going to be doing a lot of um, speaking to each other. And so this might slow down your tests, um, but if it gives you what you need for certain tests, it's probably worth it. You would just create your HTTP, HTTP response of like, in this case, it'll be what URL you're looking for that needs to be changed. You can change, you can add headers, you can uh, change the body. You can eat like, you can even do redirects um, if you wanted, or if you wanted to insert images or anything, you can do that. Um, and then whenever it happens, uh, you'd be able to change it. So this one I think is really cool. Um, I've seen a lot of cool th things that people have been doing and I've been playing with it quite a lot. Oh, sorry. And then finally, um, I, the Selenium grid, which I think a lot of people use to help scale out their tests, has been re-architected for the future. Uh, there's no longer weird, wonderful HTTP calls going across to different nodes. Um, it's been built with the future in mind. It's using modern technologies like event buses and things like that. Um, it's also had observability built into it. So if you've been using Jaeger or things like that to be able to see how your code is, um, you'd be able to, using the documentation on the Selenium project, be able to kind of integrate that with your tests. So you can see when a test did a certain thing, how that responded internally in your system, and you'd be able to track it all the way through. So if you ever get those weird and wonderful errors in the back end, hopefully the new tools from Selenium will be able to solve that with you. There's improved scalability uh, with, our, with the new Docker for, uh, images that have been created and Helm scripts, so that if you wanted to scale out really quickly, you can. And these are maintained by the Selenium project. Now, sometimes this is going to be a lot of work, but hopefully we've made it a lot easier to kind of get started uh, so that you can scale out to what you need. These should just work on kind of all your cloud providers like Azure or AWS um, or do and do whatever you need to. Um, we'll be improving this as we move forward. So if you do hit any issues, please do raise any bugs. And then there's a lot of little things that we've done in the background of kind of just making sure the code is better. Um, there's also a lot of ways that it kind of just helps users. So if you ever get stuck, the best way to do it is just get the Selenium server to print out help messages along the way, um, and you'll be able to hopefully get started. And with that, I think I've come to the end of my talk. I'm looking forward to your questions, so send them in.